This time on Backshed, I'm putting a big block Chevy in a ratty HQ. Let's take a look. So this is the HQ that I've nicknamed Mucus. About five months ago, we bought two HQs. The white one you may have seen from previous episodes. We got it running and driving, clear coated it, threw a fresh motor in it. Mucus, gonna be a little bit different. He's not great. Let's have a quick look around. He's got some holes drilled in him everywhere. His paint's shitty. A little bit of rust creeping into his guards. Dash is pulled apart in spots. There's part of the dash. Over the last few months, I've thrown a couple of new parts in, so he's he's a storage unit as well. He definitely still smells like mice. That's definitely mold. In fact, that whole hood line is covered in mold. There's a rat's nest there, and that seat's seen better days. When we first got him, he didn't have a back windscreen. We chucked one in just to seal him up for the time being, but he still leaks. He's got bits missing. Factory column automatic V8 car. And that's probably the way we'll keep him for now. But up front, here is where we're going to start. Being a V8 car, he got disc brakes up front, but he's got nothing in here. He's a blank canvas. So we're going to do whatever we want, and by whatever I want, I mean big block. Like I said, he's not great, but if you've seen the previous videos on the white car, we left him basically unmodified. He still had his factory drum front brakes, and we really didn't touch him. We just got him running and driving, sat him down a bit lower. This one is not going to be the same case. This one I'm going to do a bit of a walk down memory lane, because when I was 18, I actually had a HJ, which is the model after Mucus, with a 454 big block, turbo 400, and a 9 inch diff. And I love that combination, big block, 3 speed automatic. And so that's where we're going with this one. I really haven't touched him in five months, he's just sat around, so he's still filthy. So I guess for now, we'll get him stripped out inside, get the boot cleaned out, and start washing him down. few leftover bits from the white queue, some old seat belts, hubcaps, a cross member, that'll come in handy. And then just odds and ends left over, that was from the Statesman I think, from the white cars, 202, just generally junk that's been chucked in here over the last five months. We'll get all that out, get him cleaned up. So far this has been one of the least disgusting interiors I've stripped out but when you're stripping these old girls out label everything just so you're not putting bolts back where they shouldn't be and coming up short later on just label them keep it simple it's kind of disgusting
stripping away all the filth but if you ever had any doubts as to why I call it mucus get a go at this color scheme just sit here for a second that's like a funny car key into a green dash pad green door trim and different times of the day mucus is totally different color he goes from a bright yellowy chest infection type of a gold to a funny bronzy color of a night anyway get on with it we'll get these scuffs out get the handbrakes around out and then we'll get into the door trims get them stripped down we'll strip him down and wash inside and out these doors are pretty bad it's not so bad in there but if you see here they're quite bad along there so i'm going to get in there and, and fish oil and all that so we're going to ignore the rust for starters and just get him running and driving first we'll worry about all that other shit later So check this out, I've got the trim off the front door and the weather strips have obviously been buggered for a long time but it's been under a pine tree or something because all the pine needles have got down inside the door look at that the whole bottom of the door is full of it and hence why you're starting to surface rust and shit in there and that's why you can see all the little pitting all the, along the outside of his door there anyway, we'll keep going, we'll clean him out He's a bit surface rusty in the floor there. We'll sort him out. As bad as that looks, it's only surface rust. He's obviously been leaking, but there's no holes in this side. There's only a couple little pinholes just on that side there I'll have to weld up. And one up there, we might just zap a couple of welds on him. But other than that, I've got my work cut out. He's a bit incomplete in the dash and that sort of thing, but we'll clean up all right. So I actually plan to start mucus tomorrow, but found a couple of spare hours this afternoon. Pretty much got the inside stripped down, so it's not a bad start. Anyhow, we'll get stuck in in the morning. I just run around that a couple of times with a wire wheel and we'll get all in here pressure cleaned down and then etch primed and then we'll get inside and do the same wire wheel him up knock the drains out we'll get stuck into some serious cleaning
So that was almost a, f a full day of pressure cleaning and I've ran out of pretty much every cleaning product I had. So in the morning I'll, I'll duck in and grab some more. I still haven't finished degreasing the seats and the door trims. So there's still a little bit more cleaning to do. But I actually do like pressure cleaning this sort of old junk because it's the cheapest thing you'll do that will actually make the biggest improvement. Sure, I did uncover a little bit more rust than I thought mucus has, but I've got a short memory, so I'll forget about that and go back to thinking he's a lot better than he actually is very shortly. But in the meantime, we've still got a couple of daylight hours left, so I'm going to do what I've been looking forward to for probably five months since we got mucus. I've had an old big block in the back of my shed for a long, long time. I'm going to drag it out, start taping him up. We're going to change the colour to a factory Chevy orange or a red motor colour. I kind of want this one to feel like maybe it was the engine option that GM should have used. So this is a big block Chevy, a 396 cubic inch big block Chevy. She's only a two bolt main, but she does have a main girdle in the bottom of her. Trick flow damper, it's got a, a flat tappet hydraulic camshaft in it, some large oval port cylinder heads, and we'll get into the ports of big block Chevys a little bit later on. This 396 is actually 60 thou over with a big set of dome top pistons. 60 thou over gives it 406 cubic inches and the big dome top piston is probably going to be our undoing with this one this has got a hell of a lot of compression now why i say the high compression this motor might be our undoing is if you have extremely high compression you can run into what's called detonation yeah there's only two ways you can really fix that number one is raise the octane level of your fuel and that's probably the way we'll go if it becomes an issue we'll go to e85 or av gas or something like that well, the other way is retard your timing and to start with that's probably what I'll do is just run a conservative total timing number but if you have to retard it too far you're just giving away power so you're actually better off going to your E85s or, or race fuels or something like that anyway don't care we'll deal with it if we have to deal with it I don't care it's going in the way it is I am going to knock the covers off mask off all the areas I don't want painted and get him painted orange so why a 396 two reasons number one I have one and back in the day they weren't that expensive everyone was pulling 396s when they didn't care about matching numbers and stuff like that and fitting 454s and stuff like that so I actually have a couple of 396s from back when they were the unloved little brother the second reason I want to put a 396 more of an engineering side of things I want to put the motor I love in mucus but I also want to try and keep it legal now back in the day I had a HJ, a 74 HJ, the model after Mucus and it had a 454 and a turbo 400. Back then you could engineer a 454 in a, in a H series Holden. These days guidelines have changed and I think the equation comes up somewhere around the 417 cubic inches is the maximum you can put in a, in a H series. We're talking passenger car not utes and one tonner. Commercial vehicles have different guidelines. But I'm not going to get too technical into that shit right now. As I say, it's, a, it's about 417 cubic inches, which means if you go in big block, 427 cast number, or a 454 cast number, they're not going to like. 396, it is oversized, it's a 406. It'll fit just fine. Rather than go a big inch small block, and have to buy one. I had this thing, so that's why I'm going to go that way. I love big blocks, love this thing. It's going in mucus. So you always see the terms small block and big block Chevy. This is a small block Chevy. This is also a small block Chevy. So how do we identify them if they're not side by side? And how much bigger actually are they? Well, that is a big block Chevy rocket cover and it's maybe 75 mil longer and the easiest way to identify a small block from a big block is the fasteners one two three four on a small block and there's three across the top and four across the bottom 
So seven on a big block, four on a small block. There is a generation two small block which has fasteners down through the middle of the rocket cover. They are a Vortex small block, but they are the same dimension as this guy. So Chevy small block, Chevy big block. Morning Mugus. Right, uh, wheels are back on today. It's a nice day in the sun, so we're gonna we're gonna move mucus into the sun, warm up that floor pan and the boot, get some etch primer and some black on that. Then we'll get the stato out of the way, we'll get him in on the hoist, get him up and black underneath so we've got something clean to work with. And then we'll get into the important bit. Paint the engine bay. Right, uh, stop talking. Big day ahead. Let's get into it. So while he's up in the air, I'm going to get these shocks off because let's face it, they're not attached anyway. Get rid of the old air, air valve and drop the tank. I want to see what the inside of that tank is like before I get too involved in the fuel system to know whether to modify this tank or just go out and buy a new one. Because we're going to have to do something a little bit better with the fuel system. The old 5 16th line's probably not going to carry enough fuel for us. A little bit of rust there, but we'll ignore that. Move on. Alright, let's stop talking. We'll get the fuel tank out, we'll get those shocks out, then we'll get some etch primer on him and, and black underneath him. Check out this fuel tank and see if it's salvageable. To undo these sender units, you'll find a lot of the manufacturers are the same. It's literally just a locking ring that presses down and twists underneath that strip. So you're just getting a screwdriver, a shitty old one of course, and you're just tapping that ring until it turns around like that and lifts off.
We'll get a torch and have a look in there and see how rusty he is. Kind of hard to see in there, but how can I get you in there? It's, it's not shit. That's kind of mint-ish, sort of. Anyway, what I'm saying is it's going back in. It's good enough to go back in is what I'm saying. definitely don't need any more motivation to work on mucus I've been keen as hell to do this thing but I did just want to chuck these wheels on just for a bit of a kicker for myself my 19 year old self if I could afford it I would have put these wheels brand new on my HJ late 90s early 2000s you had a pro streeter street strip car these were the go and these are probably my favorite wheel I do love this wheel I bought them off Gumtree they're not perfect but that suits mucus he's definitely not perfect and I'd probably prefer a little bit more tyre on the back there, but hey, let's face it, traction is not mucus's biggest issue right now. Anyway, still heaps to do. It's not dark yet. I'll get this fuel tank wire wheel, get it painted. So I'm wire wheeling the tank. It's all coming off nice. I'll get all the front stripped down. This is where all the surface rust and everything was. And then I hit this bit. Just won't come off. And it's all this black stuff. I'm thinking, what is this black shit? But when you flip that tank over, because this is the back, this is rubber. It's on the driver's side behind that wheel. Two, five, three, one-legger burnouts. <laughs> I wonder if mucus was showing off for the boys or whether maybe he was showing off for the ladies. So I've been trying to chase up a new sender because that's only 5 sixteenths pipe and I wanted to go a little bit larger. However, they don't actually make one so what I might end up doing is running a small pump into a surge tank. But anyway, so instead of ordering one, I wanted to check this guy and I'll show you how you can check it. Get your multimeter, set it onto your ohm setting. It's like that little horseshoey thing. And this is your sender float. So when I get the contacts on, I'm going to raise and lower the float. So both contacts are on and you can see the ohms there will change. And if you've pulled it out of the car, you don't even need to know what the ohms range is. If you're ordering a new one, you might have to find out. But that one's going from 12, 11.9 ohms to 80 ohms. So that one still works. He's going back in. So we'll finish off the fuel tank tomorrow. We'll get that pickup back in, get it back in the car. But tonight, it's getting late, it's cold, but I'm gonna lock myself in and go on a treasure hunt. I know I've got mounts and things like this for a big block in the H-series swap, because we've done this a few times, and if ever I saw little bits and pieces at swap meets and on, on the internet, I used to grab them. So there's enough here. I have bought some new parts, like the rubbish sections of the engine mount and transmission mount. Just because your older stuff tends to be perished. And we're going to put a little bit of power through this. Anyway, I'm going treasure hunting. I'll see you in the morning. So, I've unmasked the motor. 
starting to put the accessories back on, get ready for fitting. But then you run into this shit. How do you make accessories for a set engine that don't fit? Big block Chevy rocket cover. It is hitting from there to there. Look at the gap. That is never going to seal. I'm not into bagging people's products, but I'll guarantee you the company that make these covers, they'd fit their heads, but they're a big block Chev rocket cover. And they hit all the way around there, 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 all the way around here, from that mark, there, right round to here, they just don't fit. Now that's installed with no gasket, but if they're hitting everywhere there, they're not gonna tighten down properly. So I'm gonna butcher the shit out of that lip and carve a couple of humps into those bits there and make them fit. That does my head in. That's better. I've milled off that edge there. So now they're sitting flush on that. And they're sitting right down, right down hard on the, on the surface there. That's only aluminium. So if you're grinding away alloy, make sure you blow them out with compressed air, maybe even some brake clean and everything. Get all the alloy out from the inside. Cause that shit's not happy when it goes through your motor. Anyway, we give them a good clean out. They're going back on. Boots done, inside's done. It's not mint, it's black. That's all, that's all we're doing. It's just so we can start with a clean surface and start to get some carpet, some seats in. Now we're in here, we're gonna get these sanded down, strip out everything that doesn't need to be, the hoses, the booster is gonna come out and start sanding on these inner guards, that firewall, and just clean up the chassis with a wire wheel. We've already pressure cleaned it and it's pretty good really. But we'll clean all that up. Clean up the radio support. Get all this blacked. And then maybe we can start fitting an engine. It's a lot of little things like these relays. I'm not even sure. Another one there. Obviously that's going to get replaced. I'm not even sure what they do. What they went for. Maybe he had... There's holes there. Maybe had some driving lights back in the day. But I'm going to use the delete option on them. Piss all that off. That, that can all go. We'll strip him back to basics. And we'll go from there. And as you're taking things apart, label them. That is not the factory wires. So there's no way I would have picked that if it wasn't labeled for going to the washer. So I'm going to poke it back through the firewall here. And get it out of the way for painting and find out where the factory washer bottle wiring has actually disappeared to but for the sake of keeping it simple label it you can't get it wrong so worst case scenario you can just put it back how it was i might reroute that over that side when we come back not through here and put some grommets here that one's that one's shagged and and, and that doesn't look real great but anyway we're not going to strip all this out. We're just going to take the bonnet off and flick this wiring out over the guard and then we'll get all this blacked and just bring it all back. So I guess I'll get in here later. For now, let's just get this engine bay done. But we're just going to get, these are the yellow wires here. I'm just going to pull them all through. I don't know if you can see that that well.
try not to pull my labels off. Just give him a little help to get our labels through there. Set. If I was falling off a cliff and the only way I wouldn't plummet to my death was to grab on a handful of those wires, they would come straight through that firewall without catching anything. Do you think I could get them through? Son of a bitch. So this little fella is piggybacked into the high, high low beam switch. So that guy. I'd say we were right, so they would have been aftermarket driving lights, so we can delete them. And these other two, I'll worry about them after, they're the washer bottle ones, but it should have, oh well, it should have a switch there, first of all, but the washer should be connected to this guy. Yeah, I'll get to that later. I'll just shut the door on that for now. That's later's problem. Removing all these plastic clips from that inner liner that usually hangs here They wouldn't come out. I didn't want to break them and I had an inner rage starting to burn wanting to just smash the shit out of them Ended up getting them and now we're just going to take off all these little staples They usually take your fingers apart as you're rubbing around there. So I'll, I'll just nip them off with the grinder But all the wiring's out It's hanging over the guard. We'll get this bonnet off now we're not painting inside the bonnet yet because there's little holes and things in it so i'm just going to put it back where it is after the motor goes in and see if the hood clears the carby and etc etc so if you're putting it back on and you, and your hinges aren't mint get a scribe that way when you're putting the bonnet back on you can go back to the the same holes and you've got a good chance of not stuffing around for hours getting this bonnet gap right again so scribe around the bonnet washers before you remove it. Normally, this is where I start puckering my butt cheeks. What generally happens is they will be so stuck in there, the line will be corroded to the nut. And when you start undoing that nut, this twists and breaks right there. But this one's behaving himself. So far, so good. They just come off, but first things first, smash them with heat, especially if it's one you're not gonna reuse, which we're not reusing this guy, obviously. And the booster, I don't know whether it's good or bad. I'm gonna keep it because these days getting them rebuilt is very expensive. To buy one outright rebuilt is you gotta sell one of your children. But we're gonna use a smaller booster and new master because the big block rocker cover from memory sits right there. And I think from my previous car, I actually had to dent the rocker cover, but these are aluminium rocker covers and so I had to replace this anyway rather than spending a fortune rebuilding this guy um, I'm just going to go aftermarket and smaller diameter just to increase that clearance from the rocket cover here to the booster Right, I stop talking Get into it. Yeah, I know, more pressure cleaning. But when I got the battery tray, the booster, um, and all the wiring out, it, it probably wasn't as clean as it could have been. So 
Back to pressure cleaning, of course, now it means it's got to dry out to paint, so we'll make good use of the time. I'll get the Stato out, um, put the Q back on the hoist, and get the tank in. All unmasked and you can see she's just a semi gloss black now I didn't go to a, a crazy amount of time with preparing that and I used a technique called wet on wet which is essentially over your bare metal spots you whack your etch primer and then straight over it with the black it's good enough to look good but it's not mint I wanted to get that done today because next couple of days are forecast for shit weather so I wanted that done so we can start getting that in there Next thing is booster. I've chose a smaller, more compact booster, but I will specify you don't need to. The only reason I chose the smaller booster is for the rocket cover clearance. It will fit with a factory booster, but to rebuild one of them these days, a factory HQ would cost me more than that whole kit. New master, new reduced size booster, and I can run whatever covers I want. And maybe I've got clearance for upturned headers or something later if we get a bit crazy. Well that was a pretty full on day. I'm filthy, thirsty, but we've got a ton done. Tomorrow she'll start feeling like a car again because we'll get the transmission behind the big block and lower it in place. Anyway, see you in the morning. We're getting serious today. We're gonna get a transmission on this. Well, actually, we're gonna get a flex plate on this first. Start getting the converter and trans on it. And then just slide him in, get some mounts, get the cross member in. And make it start looking like it's something. Gonna put the flex plate on the back of the crank, on the back of the motor, and you'll see there's a locator, which is here. It's that guy there. Like so. Do use a good fastener, these are ARP. If you use cheap shit on one of these, and it does happen to, to crack a couple, that'll go that way or that way, basically where your feet or something are. So, and use a decent, Loctite or something like that and then torque them into whatever the spec for your motor is One thing I like to check with aftermarket bolts is That they're gonna clear on everything I've seen some that have come through too far and have actually touched the back of the block So they're not talking and of course when you go to turn it over that's got about That's got about 30 thou clearance, but don't forget you have to add the thickness of that so they'll clear nicely. I've changed flex plates. Something didn't feel right going in with these and you want to make sure you can get these flex plate bolts in by finger or at least grab a socket on them and twist them in. But if they feel tight going in you want to make sure you're not cross-threading them. And that was what was happening here. 
you can see those little indents i reckon that squashed the hole ever so slightly and i had two that i just couldn't get in so that'll go that was off the 502 so they've already been torqued down and maybe just compress that hole a little i might pop that back on the 502 when it goes back together or if it starts doing the same thing i'll just put a new flex plate on that make sure you can put everything in with your fingers first because if you cross thread one of them the wave of misery you will feel is like no other oh one other thing with flex plates if you ever wondered which side faces out i think on almost everything the risen section there and here is converter side so that faces the converter Alright, so turbo 400 and stall converter. That's actually a used converter. I had that in one of my other cars and it made around 2800 to 3 grand flash stall. So it should be pretty good for this. Bearing in mind with a big block, it's going to flash a fraction higher than if it was behind a small block because of the increased torque. Now this turbo 400 is stock. Dead stock. We have gone through it to make sure it's a good functioning turbo 400. But I haven't built it. I'll worry about that down the track. The way I'm thinking is no motor is ever going to break a transmission if it's not running in the car. Sitting there, it's not breaking anything. So we'll chuck it together and we'll worry about building that for horsepower after we actually get the thing running and driving. But for now, this combination will make it run and drive. And that's all we're really worried about. Oh, one other thing. With your torque wrenches, if you're talking flex plates or whatever you're talking, when you're done with them, back them off to zero. Don't leave them bound up to whatever the torque setting was. They can lose tension if they're left bound up, and that'll give you shit torque. And let's face it, no one likes shit torque. So if you can gauge the converter, you'll be able to feel three distinct positions. There's your first shaft. Come on, there's your second. And there's your third. So that's in engaging the back of that converter into the pump drive, so it'll drop in three times. boxing converter installed so we've got a new transmission mount for the back and these just general gm engine mounts there's nothing special about them they're straight off the shelf just a reproduction gm and that's one thing that's good about these big bodies is it's all off the shelf you're not cutting anything you're not really building anything you're just assembling these are chevy adapter plates and if you see those bolt holes line up with that on that plate <laughs> And my little helper's painted them. He's done quite a good job on them, actually. But you can use factory 350 mounts on this, uh, you know, HQ, HT, GK sort of stuff. And it's just a factory transmission mount. There's nothing special about them. They're all off the shelf. All right, let's get those mounts on there and get it sitting in there.
so mucus has got a motor but before i start patting myself on the back i want to just run the headers in down here and just make sure they clear on my column shift um bracketry it's going to be close but i just want to make sure that's right and also get a cross member in it now i'll get the cross member in as it is there now just crawl underneath it and put that in place to take the weight of the gearbox then we'll position it properly so at the minute it's halfway through the car all the way it says so i'm going to bring it back then we'll pick it up so it's evenly weighted you don't want it trying to tilt like that that's there's no future in that shit and then we'll just start buttoning things up we'll just start adding shit until it becomes a car again Look at me being all conscientious about not marking the paint. Yeah, that was good. Hey, I've hit one little hurdle. I know I'm gonna go on about these are a bolt-in fit. I've hit one tiny hurdle. The back of the transmission pan, I'll show you. The back of the transmission pan here is just touching the cross member and not allowing me to line up these bolt holes. So this raised section of the cross member, you can see where it's just touching there on that pan, which is not allowing me to locate these two bolts and pop them up in there. But I'm not even gonna call that a hurdle because these are aftermarket spaces. If you get a factory mount, they might be five mil forward. That's all we're talking on that. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut a 10 mil slot pretty much on the ridge of that cross member and then just push that back in and just re-weld him across the top there just to get that back in. So that's the amount I cut out, about 10 mil wide, taping him off at each edge. And I just brought that back together and then just welded along it. Now I'm gonna, you can see I've just curved that around. I'm gonna grind that up nice and neat, just so it looks like it's never been there. So that's it there. Nice little recess in that. And we've welded up top edge, ground it up. I could spend more time dressing that up and making it look prettier. I'm just gonna paint it. That's how much I took out. We're just going to paint it, chuck it in. Time to start chucking some headers in. And I didn't buy a very expensive header. This is actually pretty reasonably priced. And I think I'm going to cut them about there and put a flange here rather than that neck's down quite small. Reason I chose um, the Tri Y instead of a 4 into 1 collector is because I want to keep the column shift. The column shift bracket is here and I've got another bracket to come across here so that selects your gears like so so I kind of knew I was going to have to cut this header at some point so I think what I'm going to have to do is cut through there through there put two flanges and actually space that down probably about 15 mil 20 mil something like that the other side's in and it's not so troublesome it, it fits for the oil filter but it touches the sump there probably not designed for a big wide sump so i've just marked the header there i'm going to gently just just move him over a bit so it wasn't exactly a big dent but i had to heat that section there just with the torch and give it a little push in. Doesn't matter if they're cheap headers or expensive headers. I hate denting new headers.
So that'll probably do me for tonight. A lot of little fiddly bits took a lot of time. And I'm just sitting here cleaning up some old transmission lines. They're actually in the boot of mucus, so we're re recycling his own parts. But I'm going to run some rubber lines. And I'm trying to reuse a few things that we've got laying around, like another old dipstick tube out of another transmission. I'm going to clean that up and repaint. Like, Don't get me wrong, I'll spend what needs to be spent. But like I was saying, this is kind of a trip down memory lane for me, so I sort of want to do it the same way I would have done it, the way I did my old car back when I was 19. And that's nothing elaborate, nothing over the top. And use what you got. I've cut the ends off those old transmission lines, cleaned them up, and we'll run rubber hoses forward and a cooler out here somewhere. We'll do what we do properly, but it doesn't have to be million dollar stuff. We'll I might have pressed pause on the old column shifter. I'm trying to bring together two different brackets, the trimatic column section of the bracket and the turbo 400 box section of the bracket. Didn't line up, I moved the bracket and there's so much slop and wear in every pivot and pin, it just doesn't seem to want to shift gears. So I'll press pause on that one and I'll have a think over the night, but I might end up putting a just an aftermarket shifter in it because I would hate to be trying to column shift first to second at six and a half thousand she doesn't quite grab a gear so there could be some ongoing ramifications and heartache of, um, of that column shifter I think I might end up going with a period correct shifter like something that was around in the late 90s kind of like the, the idea of the the late 90s street strip car look for mucus so that all is for tonight i'll chuck these in some fuel soak them down they're full of hornet's nests or mud or some shit and i'll get that cleaned up in the morning we'll go and get some flanges for those headers for a cheap set of headers they're actually pretty good all right that'll do me they can go in there have a swim for the night and we'll get stuck into it in the morning So back on the hoist, we're going to knock these springs out, get the new springs in, and while we're going to, nothing, and while there's nothing up here, we're going to fit the fuel pump, the new fuel lines, and sort out the vent tube and things like that. So we'll we'll get into a tank on my boot. So pump's now in at the back, we're going to start running the fuel line from the engine bay back towards the pump and just fix him off to the front. So if you see it's just a simple holly and then I've run the line out through the frame rail and along the frame rail there we've got a simple little filter there and I also have one before the carburetor runs up beside the frame and up into the inner guard the reason I sort of went the harder route and went that way in between the frame and the body and then up on the inner guard is I didn't want to come this way past the hot headers. I want to try and keep as much distance as I could. And so come up from the inner guard. I've got the, the half inch line that's come up to the inner guard into the holly reg. 
and I've just got to get a fitting for a gauge there and then just the smaller 3 8 line that's going to go to the carburetor so while he's coming down the boss has checked some emails and I've got a couple of parts at the post office so we'll go for a drive in a second probably take poppy I'd say hopefully it's the exhaust I'd love to get the exhaust on this thing today poppy's been good he hasn't really missed a beat I've been driving him to work this is muddy as shit right now but what have we got on him now 417713-ish but he's good even his radio works he's been really good actually so we're kitted up now that and that is definitely exhaust i was waiting on them can't remember what they are but anyway we'll, we'll get home and get into it Exhaust isn't going to be anything elaborate. We've just got two and a half mufflers, some two and a half pipe, and some two and a half flanges. Now, the reason I'm going to flange that for a reasonably priced header, they're pretty good and they fit well, but they neck down to about two and a quarter there, and I just want to pull it up at two and a half. So I'm going to get that flange, pull it back to there, mark at the back of that flange, and I'm going to cut it off and put the flange there. So we'll take that section off so we've just got a two and a half inch two bolt flange and then straight through exhaust two mufflers and we'll stop it there for now. All right, stop talking, get into it. That's her. And we'll get this other one welded on. So headers are bolted on now for the final time those flanges are obviously welded on but i'm going to pull up on the exhaust now because i'm waiting on a hanger bracket for the back of the car this was a 253 car and it had a single exhaust so it's only got a hanger bracket on one side and i'm waiting for a matching one on the other side i know we're jumping around a bit but we'll pull up on the exhaust and we'll get to the next one got a little hurdle with the radiator though hurdle is when the radiator is put in place it's hitting on the pump it won't go down there's two things i could do order a short water pump that will bring everything back and then order pulleys and an alternator bracket to suit however i already have the alternator bracket and i already have the pump and pulleys on there so i'm going to do the opposite i'm actually going to take the thermo fans off the back of the radiator flip them around onto the front of the radiator and then change the fan around That way the radiator will fit like that it's got a good 30 mil clearance there to the front of that water pump i'm gonna have to do some of that top tank too that's way too shiny for mucus i might paint that black but then the fans will go on the front like that Just relieve the corners to clear the radiator support and shorten these up and re-drilled the holes relieved a bit off each corner and and that's all good but what are those spare holes for michael i don't know some other stuff not my finest work not even close missed it by that far so the only other thing we're going to do is swap these fans over that way. See how the blades are contoured and curved? So these ones are obviously designed to draw. They're going to spin that way and draw. But if you knock that nut off off the middle, there's a washer there. 
and just take him off and you'll see it's it's a a d-shaped um, hole it's not a circle so you can just flip him over that way pop him back on fit him back in his keyway Now, the other thing you've got to watch with thermos is there's no real negative and positive with these. Um, wiring the black is a negative, blue is positive, will spin it one way. Wiring it the other way around will spin it the other way. Just watch your orientation. Trial them first and see which way they're going to spin just so that you don't have them still sucking air when they're at the front of the radiator. Don't laugh, have seen it. Pull that grill out. It was only sitting in there just so I could figure out where my transmission cooler had to go. Obviously the fans we flipped around, they're now on the front and we did some holes here and there and again down the bottom. So back up on the hoist, we're going to get torque converter bolts, um, transmission lines and try and finish off this exhaust. If you remember when we were installing the converter, I said there was three positions you had to get the first spine, second spine, then engaged into the pump. When it's in the gearbox properly, you'll see the gap there between the converter and the flex plate. And then you're pulling it forward. It still stays engaged to the pump. But I said you've got to bottom it out first, mate the two together, and then bring it forward to the flex plate. rubber lines onto the aftermarket cooler and everything factory the factory lines are 5 16 line and I've got 5 16 rubber hose but the cooler didn't specify what the fittings were so you're just sort of winging it um, they're clearly a bit bigger so all I'm going to do is grab your favorite cup hot water and dunk the end of the, the line in there just heat the rubber up get your redneck flaring tool and just jam him in there for a while you use anything a bolt that sharpie whatever and just let it sit for a minute and then just jam it in now here's a little curveball I didn't expect and it's not a big deal but we've had that much rain in the area, um, they're talking and shutting the highways, which doesn't affect us here getting mucus running. But I am going to now give up on waiting for that exhaust mount. I'm just going to cobble some shit together to just get it hung in the right spot, and then when the bracket turns up, then I'll weld it on. Anyway, we'll get this exhaust done.
pipes are done and they're pretty they're pretty symmetrical those mufflers seem like they're pretty level and they've just got a little kick in them there and there flanges are done but it's done this bracket back here now the factory bracket looks like like that where it's um underneath the clamp up through the the rubber and then tape it off on the edge now i just folded that one up to replicate a factory one but this guy did the same but then just screwed it straight to the floor until the mount turns up and then all i'll do is weld up that hole and bend it here and just match the other one the other thing i already put the springs in but every time i lifted the hoist they fell out because they're quite short so you'd lift it they'd they'd come out of that top saddle and they'd drop out so every time you're putting it down um, I had to make sure they were in their saddle it was getting painful so I actually took them back out and did a lot of the other work but for now I chucked them back in and I've run some fencing wire from there to there and just tied them so they can't fully droop and I'll drop it down and see the ride height these are super lows that's a 235.60 drag radial. Um, I don't hate it. Actually, let's see where the exhaust is. Oh, that's not too bad. That's like 150 mil or so. Maybe, maybe more. So that's the lowest point there. The transmission cooler in, got the lines run, the fans are on, radiators in, all the hoses are done. I started putting water in it thinking, going amazingly well, put some water in there, added a little bit of coolant, and then this. That is the sort of shit that makes your soul cry. It's not just leaking, it's pissing out. Anyhow, that's a super easy fix. I just whip off the manifold, there's not a lot to it. I actually found two sets of gaskets, a rectangle port and an oval port, but we'll go through that a bit later. So we'll whip the intake off, I'll get those gaskets in and then we'll, we'll get the other bits and pieces buttoned up. So here's where we're at obviously you saw these front bolts were not tight that one was leaking badly so we're going to err on the side of caution i'll knock out the plugs drop that oil make sure there's not any water in the sump and plugs out and just wind it over by hand i guess this is the perils of dealing with second hand and old stuff but keep it a small issue let's get on with it we'll get it fixed these are a, a large oval port head and looks like they've been cleaned up a bit too so these are the same heads that were on my old big block it made 526 horsepower 525 foot pounds of torque so you can get good power out of these oval port heads while i'm having the time of my life chasing water through the sump potentially we'll talk big block ports for a second in the cast iron general motors factory heads there's predominantly three different ports so rather than try and fumble around with three sets of heads i'll show you on manifolds what we're talking about so as I said, three different port sizes, a big rectangle called a large port oval. And then there's the, the small oval port, peanut port, round port, whatever you want to call it. But they're predominant, they're almost a square. So small and large oval and rectangle. But those cylinder heads and those manifolds only really good to about 5,000 RPM. Make yourself a nice little street motor or a good pickup motor or something like that. As long as you don't go crazy with camshaft, they won't support anything over 5,000. This guy, that's what's on mucus. That was what, what was on my old big block. Um, they'll make good power out to 6,500-ish. If you're going to go any harder than that, it's probably the way to go. That's with the cast iron stuff. Obviously, there's a lot of aluminium heads on the market these days. But we're just running what we've got. Different port, depending on what you're doing, whether it's street stuff or strip stuff or whatever. But you know what I like about big blocks? Everything.
despite popular belief, you don't need to torque these bolts down until you shit your pants. 25 foot-pounds is all that's recommended, and that's significantly prior to shitting your pants. Back on the ground, oil's back in it, and now we're going to chuck the distributor in it and start getting a few wiring bits and pieces done. Now, from when I painted this motor, I never actually did the rocker covers back up. I've only sat them on there for dust. And the reason being, when you go to set your timing up, the furthest forward cylinder will be number one, and in this case on the Chevy, it's it's passenger side for us, driver side for in the states why is that important lining up your timing marks you want cylinder one top dead center and then set your timing up from that how to find out if you're not 180 degrees out being a four-stroke engine the piston comes to the top of the cylinder twice comes up once to fire back down comes up again to exhaust the gas and then back down so you want to make sure that you're not trying to fire the cylinder when it's trying to push exhaust gas out if you've got your cover off you can make sure that you're not 180 degrees out the engine over and watching for the intake valve to open and then close reason being if the intake valve is open it's taking air in when it shuts it'll be coming back up and that's what it wants to fire so that's your intake valve see it lines up with the intake port and your exhaust lines up with your exhaust so that's the intake valve there that's the one we want to watch when that valve closes the next time we see our timing mark that'll make sure you're not 180 out here he goes you're watching there he's just just starting to open so there he's closed that means the pistons at the bottom of the cylinder traveling upwards on its compression stroke and at the top it will fire so the next time we see our timing mark here that will mean that that cylinder is about to fire there's our zero there and our zero there i'm going to leave it right in between zero and ten roughly about five six degrees it'll start a bit better um, just in front of zero rather than top dead center all right let's get the dizzy in we're just going to plop the distributor in and i've marked number one general rule of thumb when you're fitting a distributor i've just sat that there for illustration is make your number one lined up with your number one cylinder So once you get your distributor in, if you remember you've lined up top dead centre there, you had number one marked on the cap and you've got it marked on the body. Your distributor fits in and you put your rotor button at that mark and that way when that goes back on, so that's, that's your cylinder one terminal there and you see you've got your marks lined up, there's the rotor button right there. I decided to get into this alternator and get the spacing. Now this is just a universal low mount kit. And I don't mind these because depending on what pulleys you've got, you just trim this section back here to bring it closer to the block or, or further out. If you can see, I'm using the, the furthest back V-belt line there. So I reckon if I get a vernier down here, I think we need to take about 15 mil out of these to bring this guy back in line 
I swear I ordered a black alternator. I swear to God I did. I'll get these spaces out, nip 15 mil out of them, and hopefully that'll line this guy up with that fella back there. So that's looking a lot better. I'll see if I can find a belt somewhere around here. I've just shortened these three spacers and they're your off cuts, but don't throw them away. They're now perfect 10 mil spacers for some other shit. Just starting to lay this wiring out and get it organized. And obviously that's it's one headlight. That fell down there. This guy comes across the radiator support to that headlight. And then this guy, I think, comes up to here, which means that used to go down there as the starter. That'll be the solenoid of the starter, and that was actually the starter wire. It's pretty piss poor starter wire, I've got to say, but I'll strip them back and pick them up over here somewhere and drop them straight down. Instead of working around this, I'm going to push him out. It's not too bad a weather today, so we'll get him out away from the hoist, get the doors open. And then get into this wiring we'll figure out up under that dash there i want to put a relay panel so i'm going to make a, a little relay panel and i'm using acrylic i'm using a, a piece of acrylic not for any reason other than i have it I do like the acrylic because it's easy to bend or drill holes in it. It's also insulated, so if you're running wires through it, you don't have to put grommets. We'll line up a couple of relays across here and we'll start bringing some wiring in and, and, and just do it all here on the bench. So when we're putting it in, it's going to go that way up underneath the dash. This section will just screw to the original dash. So progress first things first don't freak out about the the used relays of I'm just using them to get my wiring right I've actually got new ones coming with fuses in the top so that when you're looking this way at the panel you can see the fuse or replace the fuse I like them because they're nice and simple and you're not having to run other wiring with you So we've got my relay panel, it's going to go up under the dash like so. So if you come down low you can see him there. You won't be able to see him just looking at him like that. So that's, I'll just sit that there. And my relay and my switch panel, all it is, is on the back. I've just looped all the negatives. And as I say, that little fella there, he will go here. And I've looped all the accessory power that guy and he will come from over here across the fuse box there so when that goes in it will slot in there like that and it will look absolutely magnificent for mucus maybe not for everyone so in order to get some power to the gauges to figure out if they work I might have to start out here um, Start with the battery cable, of course, and then start getting the alternator wired up. Um, I still need to get a belt too, forgot about that. Get some power into the cab and then see if we can't start lighting this thing up.
just waiting for the soldering iron to heat up so I can finish off the starter wire, um, the solenoid activation wire and also uh, the power wire that runs back into the fuse box to power everything up in the cab. I made a heap of battery cables up um, from positive to starter, um, negative to the, to the block, another negative from the block to the frame and things like that and, and you don't have to just buy generic ones great if you can but if you're just going to get a length they're pretty simple just strip him like that put your heat shrink on first that's there now <clears throat> and you buy these little crimp ends they obviously just slide on now this one won't go on because it's actually I've ran out of big ones that I used but essentially it's just slide him on onto your cable Get your old crimpers, cheap set off eBay or whatever, um, and they've got different size jaws in them, and that just slides in there, and you just pump him till it squashes it. You slide your heat shrink back up, and heat him with heat him with the heat gun. Simple as that. That way you don't have to stick with generic lengths and that sort of thing, and have excess everywhere. You can just make them yourself. Day, but I think I actually realized why I'm not that fond of wiring and it's not the wiring itself this car was pretty clean it didn't have a lot of excess wiring in it so I wasn't really pulling out butchered shit it was pretty good and it's, all the factory harness is really good but I think the bit I found that annoys me is I just spent most of the day and it looks no different <laughs> You look at it and it's not like you're, you're fitting the motor or you're doing body work where it jumps out what you got done for the day. There's now power from that battery when connected into the cab through the starter wire, through the hot wire and the starter going into the cab to the fuse box. And so essentially, if I roll the key on now, I should have dash lights. But... But the problem there is I went in to roll the key on to get dash lights and acknowledge my amazing achievement for the day and then remembered I don't have a key the ignition doesn't turn on so so first job in the morning is knock that steering wheel off I have got a key barrel for it um, that I ordered when the two of them the white one and this guy turned up so steering locks not on but I got I can't roll the ignition on. So first thing in the morning, wheel's got to come off. We'll get this ignition in there. We'll get that barrel in there. So then I can start weeding through all this garbage. So I've done steering wheel removal and the indicator mechanism removal. Once you're to that point, it's not real hard. There's a little slot there, but essentially it's that there, that little piece of wire, wire there, and you're trying to push down on that, and that depresses this thing, this little tab here. That should allow it to come out. The problem is though, when I go to pull on it, that happened. So that's not helping. So now I've got to try and push that down as well as somehow try and drag this out. So I'll struggle away with it. So that turned out to be a solid 40 minute job. It should have been a five minute job because all you're really doing you see there, it's just pushing that little tab down. But I found it was so seized and stuck out that I really had trouble holding it down when there was really nothing to pull on. I was essentially trying to, trying to pull at it like that. It got to a point that I essentially grabbed that screwdriver 
jammed it in there and got brutal on its ass. And guess what? Winning. Anyway, let's get on with it. So I just put the key in and I thought I'll just I'll just see and listen. That's the starter trying to engage. So I don't know whether the starter's now, I didn't even mean to do that actually. I forgot I'd connected the battery up. So I don't know whether the starter's hitting on the flex plate or whether the starter's shagged. But anyway, I guess we'll figure that out. That's the first signs of life of mucus for 20 years, but. So now we've got an ignition and like I said, you're turning, the starter wants to engage. I know that starter was okay, so I'm just gonna uh, pull it apart and check the armature. But here's some other amazingness I found. And this is this shit's cool, this shit works. That's foil wrapped around a fuse. That shit gets you home. Anyway, I'll check a few fuses, make sure they're right, but first signs of life. Doesn't go, but still. Wants to wind over. So I say, those guys go right through. I've undone them. So you can see that's the actual motor and you see that armature there that's very very scored and a bit burnt and these little brushes they actually run around that armature there so if there's poor contact there and there it's definitely not going to do its job so this might have still worked when i chucked it in the box years ago but i'm going to clean that up and maybe just clean the tip of those brushes pretty much the same way we did in I don't know about episode 8 with the Statesman power window motors. They're essentially the same thing, an electric motor, armature and brushes. So we'll clean that up with a little bit of sandpaper. Just clean off the ends of that. Cleaned up with the contact cleaner. Clean that guy there. And that bolt. And chuck him all back together. So for this guy, I'm just going to get a bit of sandpaper and go around it. Normally I'd use a a block and go around it but this isn't too bad so you're not trying to sand this down heavily you're just going to get it and just keep doing that that's 280 um, I'll probably clean it with 280 then go down to something like an 800 that's 800 now You can go pretty hard at them to the point where they're only really buggered when the ribs are missing. So if there's ribs there, you can save it. Now with the brushes, I'm not going to try and sand them. I'm just going to clean the tips of them. So you're just really gently going over them. So once that part's cleaned, you've got to reinsert him back in that way. The hard bit is, these brushes are all pushed in. So what you can do is get this spring here, pull him up, and sit them like that. So you're sitting the spring up on top of the brush without it trying to push back in.
wine over, but it, um, and you can hear it pick up oil pressure. But it still seems pretty slow. Anyway, I'll worry about it once we get it fired. Dash is still in pieces and I haven't completed the shifter and went for an old school type of shifter too. Initially I was a bit disappointed I couldn't keep that column shifter but I'm shallow as shit, I'm already over it. But, but there's my little relay panel with the fuses. I wasn't trying to completely hide it or anything like that, I just wanted it easy to get at. You know what shits me? When you order a throttle cable, it should be 900 long. Uh, it should go to there. That's only 600 long when it turns up. Anyway, I guess I'll improvise and just pull it by hand for now and order another. Well, as far as I can tell, this is pretty much it. I'll just pull the throttle by hand from the windscreen there. Well, let's give her a hit. Just one thing before we actually fire it, to break in a flat tap at cam and lift the set, as soon as it fires, you have to take it to a high idle, uh, 1800 to 2500 RPM, um, just to make those two surfaces in. Now, I'm getting off light here, the cam is not brand new, it's already done one season, so I'm literally just mating the, the lifters to that cam surface. Now these are an anti-pump up hydraulic lifter, so there will be a fair bit of valve train noise for two reasons. Number one, it's still got air in them, still bleeding air out. Number two, an anti-pump up lifter will actually sound more like a solid lifter, so it will be quite chattery. But that's a conversation for another day. We'll go through hydraulic lifters, solid lifters, roller lifters. We'll do that another day. So the minute she fires, we'll pull her up to a high idle. She'll stay there for 20 minutes. And the reason I say that, everyone loves to hear that rough, lopy idle when they put a brand new cam in. But trying to get it idle the minute you fire it is a perfect way to destroy that cam and lift the package before you've even got going. So let's get her fired. So we'll skip ahead, there's basically 20 minutes of that, then I'll just bring it back to a normal idle and, and that's pretty much the break-in process for the lifters.
off. Jesus Christ, is that more rust? What would you call that? Like the, the knob and the shaft out? Uh, that was weird. <laughs> I just, I just fell. <laughs> so I think I barely did shit my pants. <laughs> Maybe a vacuum first. Now you're right. I wasn't doing anything. Oh, we've got the fucking lens cap on. I'm using the front. I knocked that shit over. This time I'm back shed. I'm pulling out my shotgun and taking out every noisy bird on the planet. Oh, for fuck's sake. Now go down, dickhead. Bottom of the door, so I'm going to have to get all that out. Shut up, seriously. So that took a bit longer than I expected. Uh, it's about eight days of wrenching over two and a half weeks trying to fit it in around work and the like, but we're at the point now where we can drop the running oil, relash the valves and, and that's it, she's running. If you've seen previous episodes, you know, I do like my ratty stuff, I like my survivor stuff, and more importantly, I like my running and driving shit regardless of condition. So that's now running. Do stick around, share with your mates, hit the buttons and that sort of thing. Because the next time you see the HQ, we're going to work on the driving side of things and hit an eighth mile so I can take up my built up frustration out on this thing. Anyway, thanks for watching.